Glad Stephen F. Kolzak Award is given to an openly LGBT media professional who has made a significant contribution in the fight for equality and acceptance. Tonight, I'm here to honor someone who, through her words and through her actions, proves that she is a force of nature. She tells the world that no one can judge us and no one can stop us. She is a woman of many talents. She is my friend, Ruby Rose. <laughs> Ruby uses her voice to change the conversation about gender and inclusion. So now please raise your voice for the one and only Ruby Rose. Just Taylor Swift somebody. That's not a thing. That's not fair. I like I'm a really emotional person and I had to go through all the possible things that could happen that might trigger me to cry. I didn't think about Taylor Swift coming to give me the award. But I'm hanging in there. Breathe. I'm gonna I'm gonna put this down because I use my hands a lot and I'll I'll start doing weird things. That'll be a thing. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for this recognition. Thank you so much to GLAAD. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to receive the Stephen F. Kolzak Award. And you know, it just goes to show how much can happen in a year because last year I found myself at the New York GLAAD Awards uh, and my co-star Jackie from Orange is a New Black who was up there briefly, she had this great idea that I should just sneak in, that that would be okay. Now. I'm not proud of this. I didn't go all the way. I didn't sneak into the formal part of the night, thank God, because you saw what I was wearing. But I did make it into the after party, and it was amazing. And it was just this room full of people celebrating the LGBT community. I was in awe. But um, at the same time, I did have that looming feeling that any minute someone would tap me on the shoulder and be like, ma'am or sir, if they came from behind me. <laughs> And they would be like, you're not supposed to be here. Like, who are you? Where's your wristband? I don't think nobody has, I, the, the wristband's obviously not a thing, but if it was, I didn't have one. And they would have technically been right questioning me, but now a year on, it is such a relief to know that I am supposed to be here because she said so, and because <laughs> these people said so, and my face is on the website to prove it. But well, here's the thing, you, you don't need, I'm <laughs> really like going at this thing. Take that off the TV thing. Um, you don't need to, to gate crash a party to know that feeling, right? The, that feeling that you're somewhere that you don't belong or that you don't deserve to be and not fitting in, not being part of the popular table, being an outsider, wondering if someone's gonna tap you on the shoulder and say that you're a fraud. It's a go-to response for me and so many other people. That feeling doesn't just go away even when you are invited to the cool table or when you're the honoree of an event. <laughs> but I know that many of you guys can relate when I say that that voice that says shitty things in your head, it, it's always there. You just get a lot better at shutting it up. Now, I'm not just speaking to the people in this room right now. I'm speaking to the people of the LGBT community who are watching this from home. I want to let you all know from my heart that I, and that we, that Taylor, <laughs> supports you. I want every young adult who questions whether they are worthy to hear me when I say, yes, you are. It's so interesting to be receiving an award about visibility because for such a large part of my life, I just wanted to be invisible. But I had this feeling that I didn't have a choice. I felt like there was so much wrong with me and there was so much weird about me that everywhere I went, everyone knew that I was weird and everyone just saw straight through me. I was out from the age of 12. I felt discomfort in anything feminine, still do. Uh, I practiced looking like a boy and still do. And I got appalled when I got breasts, sometimes still do. I was very honest about these things. So, sorry, I feel like a coat hanger. 
feel like a coat rack. Uh, so naturally, because I was so open about that, I, uh, yes, I spent a lot of time in a very vulnerable place with little to no support. And I was stalked, I was verbally abused and beaten until I was hospitalized. And I attempted suicide like, so many times. I wasn't cool and I didn't belong. And that's all I was ever told by everyone for what seems like eternity. And I would hide out and read books in the library and I would dream of a career as a child psychologist who would better help people. And I would dream about writing a book for kids to read that felt like me so they wouldn't feel alone. And I dreamt of being a famous singer or an actor who through my work could inspire others to be themselves, to just hang in there. Now, I have no idea how I dreamed so big when I felt so small, but I know that it's what got me through each day. And I basically, I wanted to be the person that I needed and couldn't find anywhere in my life. A little bit like that glass of water that I desperately want but can't see. So if anyone would like to leave one. Uh, when I look to film, TV, magazines, and the media, love you, kind sir. I promise it's water. Now, when I look to the media, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm going to keep meeting this. There was no one, there was no one that represented the feelings that I had. And there was no one there to validate who I was or to let me know that I was normal. I literally thought that I was the only gayer in the village. And I remember during a school break discovering this terrible soapy or soap opera. You guys make it sound real dramatic, but it was a soapy. And there was a lesbian character my whole life lit up and I felt like part of me found hope in a daytime soap opera, like really. And I am sure that she was 30 and I was definitely eight, but I was gonna marry this woman. It was super short lived though, because um, she was killed off in like three episodes. There was like a tidal wave and like a natural disaster that killed the only one lesbian in the show, like, like a punishment or something. So fast forward a few years, and Q, see how much more confident I am with water? <laughs> I've read, I promise it's water. Q, the L word. That was my first religious experience. That show probably saved my life. And I feel like it, it made me feel like I existed. Like somewhere in the world, there was a place for me and I wanted to get there really quickly. But slowly but surely, year after year, I watched the world, it, it changed and it's evolving. And we've come such a long way. And that is because of GLAAD. GLAAD was there pushing the studios to do better. Demanding the LGBT people be represented. I don't even want to think about a, a world without GLAAD because it's like a, a giant big LGBT superhero that we all needed. And I am just so blessed to have experienced both sides of this journey. To have searched endlessly for, as a child, for someone that I could relate to on TV and then coming full circle and being in a show that I know has done the same thing for so many people. So thank you so much to Orange is the New Black. Thank you to Jen Houston for casting me. For Genji for creating Stella, the same way that she created so many other beautiful, diverse characters. I truly understand how important it is that we are not invisible, that young people everywhere can turn to the media and be included not treated like they do not or should not exist. Suicide rates are too high in the LGBT youth to stand in silence. We, the media, set the bar of acceptance by including LGBT characters on our screens. Through our work, we have been given an opportunity to raise awareness about LGBT issues and use our voices to fight for equality. It is our responsibility to continue driving the dialogue forward by embracing the differences in others with love and kindness and respect. Yes. <laughs> so, so thank you, Glad, And thank all of you for making moments like this possible now and in the future.